Hello and welcome back to my channel. Thanks for stopping by. Recently, when I was digging through some storage, I came across this. Star Wars portfolio. I got this when I was a kid. It was 1977, I was 12 years old, I had seen Star Wars, and this turned up in, I think, Walden's Bookstore of all places. So, like most kids, I immediately had to have this and my parents got it for me. Now you can see the condition that this is in. It's in this condition because of love, not neglect, okay? Uh, I've never been one of those uh, in the box, like new, never opened kind of kids or later guys. It's just not the way I do things. Uh, if you're gonna buy something, you might as well enjoy it. So I thought about holding these up and talking to you about them, but then you're just gonna see too much of my old mug. So let's, uh, let's switch this over to uh, camera down, well lighted, and let's get a good look at the Star Wars portfolio. It's just full of fascinating images by artist Ralph McQuarrie. Okay, here we are, and we switched over to our top-down view to look at the portfolio. First thing I wanted to point out was I also found this photograph of Harrison Ford. So this is Harrison Ford standing near the corner of, let's see, Chestnut Street, which is behind him, and Prince Street, which would have run perpendicular. And uh, this was during the filming of the movie Witness. I was an enterprising young photographer, and I was out walking around taking pictures, and I actually ran into a friend of mine, and Jim noticed Harrison going by on a BMX bike and called him over. This guy comes pulling up on a bike, and it's Harrison Ford, and I mean, you know, Yes, Harrison Ford pulled up, but so did Han Solo. I was just freaking out. I was just out of my mind. I couldn't believe it. But I had my camera, and I asked him if it would be okay if I took pictures while we talked to him. And he said, sure, go ahead. But uh, anyway, it was a real thrill to meet him. And the uh, reports of being a curmudgeon were vastly over-exaggerated. I mean, I know he may have changed in the ensuing years, but when I met him here, he was a really nice guy. So the other thing I wanted to uh, highlight was this hardback edition of Star Wars. As you can see, it says it was written by George Lucas. So you can tell that this is an especially old one because we know that that's not who did the novelization. Uh, Alan Dean Foster did the novelization. So here we have the uh, cast listed on the back. So this is definitely the movie tie-in to, uh, to the original script as it was written a long time ago. I'm not entirely sure what the copyright is on this. Oh, look at that. If you're from the area where I come from, Lancaster, Pennsylvania, uh, Cafe Angst is a great source of uh, old memories for a lot of us. It was one of the first, not the only, but the first successful cafes in town. And uh, no idea what that is. Oh, that's a uh, commemoration to an old friend of mine who was a poet. So, oh yeah, we were just gonna just take a quick look here and just see, oh, there we go, from The Adventures of Luke Skywalker. And uh, as some of you will know, and maybe some of you don't, uh, Star Wars initially was The Adventures of Luke Skywalker, not A New Hope. They changed it later when they realized they had uh, marketing gold in their hands. And so there we go, copyright 1976, so. Can't go wrong with that. This was from the, uh, from the early days before they realized how much money they were gonna make off of this with the toys and the movie tie-ins and later selling it to the evil empire. I mean, Disney. Okay, so I've got a cup of coffee here and I am damn well gonna enjoy that thing while we're doing this. So I will edit out me drinking that coffee as we go along. And you might notice some of those editing jumps while we're doing this. Uh, this is Corsica by La Colombe, made in a Technovorum Mocha Master, the best coffee maker in the world for drip coffee. There's no need to argue that in the comments because it's a fact. So let's get down to our portfolio here. Many of the things that happened in Star Wars were envisioned in this portfolio. They just came at later stages. So when you're looking at this portfolio, you can see that there's a lot of uh, wear and tear 
uh, around these various points. And that is because this was a loved portfolio and a used portfolio. I got it brand new at Walden's Books in 1977 when this thing came out. Uh, my parents went and got it for me. Uh, I was you know, terribly enthusiastic for Star Wars, just like everybody else at that time. Star Wars was a life-changing event for my 12-year-old brain. I remember when it came out, my sister went to see it, and she came home and said, you need to go see that movie, kid, that has you written all over it. And she was right. And I got my friends to come and see it with me, and I think we went to see Star Wars every day we could. We'd stay and watch two or three or four shows, go home and eat, come back and get in again and watch it again sometimes. Uh, we were absolutely inundated in the summer of 77 with Star Wars. We just went absolutely crazy for it. And I think my enthusiasm for Star Wars was probably unparalleled uh, until I started to discover the, you know, the greater depths of science fiction. And I started to read what science fiction authors were saying about Star Wars. But overall, I've never lost the love for the thing that definitely made me want to not only read science fiction, but write it. So here's the back. And there's just a, a you know some nice lettering and uh, various things on the back here, and this is just meant to be encouraging, I would imagine. But it's uh, the mind-boggling imagination and graphic brilliance of artist Ralph McQuarrie. So I think that that is uh, essentially a, a great way to describe Ralph McQuarrie. As you look in the images in here, uh, many of them uh, are one-for-one -one matches for what happened in the movie. And so I haven't looked at a whole lot of this level of preconceptual work, but I have looked at almost everything that Sid Mead has done. And I know that on Blade Runner, uh, much of Sid Mead's visual uh, concepts became the actual movie that you saw. So, I mean, I, I think that Ralph McQuarrie, you know, while he was alive, uh, was certainly, you know, very proud that uh, the work that he had conceptualized became the movie almost on a one-for-one -one basis. And when you figure that some of that, he just had to pull out of his imagination and based on what they were looking for budget-wise, it's pretty astounding. So once again, this, this thing is in, definitely not in the best condition and that's just because it got used. Uh, I, I, as a child, or a young man, I should say, I look through this thing all the time. I was always letting my imagination run with this thing. So now I just want to get these in, there's some kind of order to have a look here. The wrapper, the wrapper that this came with was at one time in, you know, absolutely excellent condition, but you know, it's a little messed up. And I mean, I guess I'm showing it to you like I'm selling it, but I'm not selling it. So, you know, I just want you to see the kind of condition it's in. It, it has held up pretty well. There's just a little bit of yellowing here and there. Uh, and you know, that could be acid content in the paper, not sure. But uh, there's just a, a quick overview of uh, Ralph McQuarrie and his uh, connection to the Star Wars production. So, but this has really helped keep these things in good condition. So we're definitely gonna keep that handy. So we'll go with this as the first plate. So the plates are not in any kind of numbered order. So we can just enjoy them as they are. This is a really great over the shoulder view uh, from the vantage point of a TIE fighter pilot. Now the painting provided the feeling of battle over the Death Star from an enemy point of view. The targeting device in the cockpit was conceived by Macquarie as being part of a radar and location in indicator. So I thought this was just a really beautiful rendering of the concept of targeting scopes and radar and uh, weaponry. There's a really great detail on the image and the TIE fighter pilot. I thought the TIE fighter pilot himself is incredibly realized there. I really, I just really love that. And you, you can see that scope design is very similar to some of the scopes that we saw in the movie and how they were applied. There are subtle differences. And I mean, the important thing to remember is that back in 1977, this was also how we envisioned interfaces. So the scenario in this has him apparently attacking the uh, Millennium Falcon. And I wouldn't know if this was during the arriving or the leaving. We know that they are attacked when they leave from seeing the film. 
I really like Macquarie's idea for a control panel for an advanced fighter like that. It's an interesting idea and ties in the fact that things would need maintenance, right? So there's handles, access panels, different things like that. It all comes together very nicely. The Death Star detail is really, really well done. That center trench is there, as always. And we have that. I think the TIE Fighter cockpit view uh, acquired some more uh, panel, panel veins and mullions, different things going across uh, the pilot's field of view. Uh, which would be more uh, more of a retro tip of the hat to what pilots saw, you know, in the old days. And all of those things definitely were an influence on George Lucas and his team as they were making this. So here we have an incredibly dynamic scene. I like how uh, M Ralph McQuarrie was portraying the uh, interiors of the Death Star. I know that he had even created a scenario for where the energy came from and how the light was provided since you can't see a lot of apparent light sources but does appear to be light everywhere. You know, and then of course there are, there's also an unlit corridor here. It says that here we have an incipient confrontation as a small group of fugitives try to escape the Imperial Stormtroopers. Chewbacca is carrying the princess a bearded Han Solo can be seen in an earlier costume design, a blue outfit with a cape of all things. And Luke is in the background. You know, it's interesting that in these images, you kind of see the progression also of character development and ideation that Lucas and co were probably working with as they went through here. And actually here is uh, where it says that, and I remember this from reading this from long ago, I'm 57 now, and the last time I read this, I was probably a teenager. It says here, Macquarie envisioned the hallways as being lit indirectly through thin slots. Defying standard principles, the light would radiate from these narrow spaces at 360 degrees, while the slots themselves would be detectable only from particular angles. It would be a testament to the genius of these people that they discovered a key to the universe that permitted them to harness an incredible energy in this manner. Those are great ideas, aren't they? Once again, if you, know, if you want to be a conceptual artist, you have to be able to consider a scenario. And of course, if you're a writer, you definitely do. So here's a, here's a nice pull in on the intrepid heroes. So that is supposed to be Han Solo out front there. That is a completely different idea for Chewbacca, right? And uh, there we have uh, Luke somewhat cowering in the background. Uh, we know that changed later uh, and changed significantly. Uh, as his character developed. Now, he wasn't in his full powers in Star Wars, as you'll recall. He was just coming into them and just learning what it was to be a warrior. Here we have stormtroopers carrying shields and their leader out front is armed with a lightsaber. Now, as much as that is a thing now, I remember the first time I saw this image uh, as a kid and I saw a stormtrooper carrying a lightsaber and it just blew my mind. I was like, wow, this is, you know, this is an idea that I felt like they should have went with. You know, they, they should have had stormtroopers carrying shields and different things like that. And as it turned out in the later films, they did, but you know, that was much later. The, the stormtroopers we got introduced to up until, you know, many years later, were just almost bungling boobs who, you know, like the gang who couldn't shoot straight. Uh, they, they were not that dangerous to the heroes. And so that often felt a little contrived, but these stormtroopers seem to be uh, more competent and they are definitely out hunting the, the good guys. Another thing that I really like about this image is the wonderful split between the light and the dark side. And uh, you know, the good guys are even on the light side, the bad guys are on the dark side. And uh, even this early in the process, you know, the bad guys are incredibly well conceived. This next image is, if you'll recall from the movie, the part where they're fleeing from the stormtroopers and they get split up. And although that looks like Han Solo, that is actually Luke. So this is when the drawbridge was retracted 
And you know, of course, they have to go swinging across and it's a great adventure and a lot of fun. I always thought that this scene in the movie had the most amazing tie-in of the use of music for action and uh, the sound effects of them being attacked. I just kind of thought it all just worked perfectly together. The sound, the music, the action, their dialogue. You know, it, it really put the opera in space opera in this particular scene. So if you're ever watching the movie again, just watch it from the moment that they shoot the controls to the door and they can't, they can't extend the bridge. And then just the way that the music, the lyrics and the action all come together just for that little scene. Now, of course, all of Star Wars is like that. It is incredibly operatic. Um, you know, Wagner could have worked on this film. Uh, it almost seems like he did in some parts, and he certainly had an influence on the guy who put the music together, as did uh, Korngold, of course. The, uh, just the wonderful detail that Macquarie put over here with his light sources and his line work, and uh, it doesn't look random, you know, in any way. We can go in close on the two intrepid characters. And it looks like uh, Luke at one point was going to be outfitted much more like Han Solo. And you can see that this is a big change from how they were even doing his character ideation in that last image with the, the stormtroopers with shields and lightsabers. Uh, the heroic progression of the development of the character is you know, much greater here. I, I really love the way Macquarie uses light and color and shadow. You know, there's a real sense of scale and depth in this image. And there's a little bit of glare there, of course. That's, let's see if we remove that glare. And that really helps that come up. This is our next image, and it's a clear tip of the hat tribute, you might say, to Fritz Lang's Metropolis. This definitely uh, resembles that robot character that appears in that movie and transforms into a woman. So this was an early concept idea for C-3PO. You can see R2-D2 in the background here, of course, and the escape pod that they use to get away from the fleeing rebel ship. The painting represents R2-D2 and C-3PO first arriving on Tatooine after their narrow escape from the Imperial Stormtroopers via a life pod, which, uh, as I had said here, can be seen in the background. Macquarie used a photograph of the Oregon coast to guide his painting of the landscape uh, following the line of the cliff and replacing the ocean with sand dunes, which I thought was, a, you know, what a really great idea. Uh, as many of you know, Dune was an incredible influence on uh, George Lucas and his creation of Star Wars. I mean, along with a lot of other factors, including Japanese film and other, other such stories. And of course, uh, Edmund Hamilton doesn't get a lot of credit, but his uh, space operas, the uh, Star Kings, definitely played a role. And remember that he was married to Lee Brackett, who penned the first draft of the script for The Empire Strikes Back. So I, I always thought that this image reminded me a lot of the work of John Schorner, who did all of the original illustrated Dune illustrations and paintings, which were featured in Omni Magazine and of course are also in Illustrated Dune. And uh, his portrayal of the Saudakar in that book, I always thought were among the best. Here we go with just some details. We can cut in. And in the background here, we see the details on the escape pod. And I think it's uh, really cool that the escape, escape pod resembles the technology of the time for uh, 1977. And uh, Ralph McQuarrie was probably pulling on uh, NASA concepts and ideas and then uh, adding his own futurized, maybe uh, extrapolated ideas for what an escape pod on a ship would look like. Sorry, that's shaking around so much. Just holding it in my hand. So from here, we see a close-up of the early concepts of R2-D2. And I think at one time he, he kind of walked by uh, almost like a one-legged person on crutches kind of move. And here we have the 
It's a close-up of the C-3PO concept. And I mean, this isn't too far from what they finally settled on. I mean, you've got to make a suit that an actor can wear and not completely suffocate in. And also it has to have fixable, repairable, and replaceable parts, right? The uh, ideas meet reality and things change. That's just the way it is. And there's a good look at that image. It's always been one of my favorites in the portfolio. This is a concept that Macquarie put together for the sand people, and it shows them living among space junk and different things like that that have crashed on the planet. And it kind of ties in very nicely with their identity as scavengers and uh, people living in the wastelands. I, I would imagine that there's uh, some kind of backstory they came up with on Tatooine, and I know that it's all been canonized you know, since then, but we have to go with what they had in 1977, and things had not been canonized and beaten to death by uh, you know, staff for Lucas and fans and uh, you know, teams of writers. You know, back then, they were using a much simpler approach, so you, know, you had to give these people a story. And so it was just basically as simple as I described. So here, if you look at the Banthas, they, uh, they have this kind of like pig snout nose idea thing going on there with the horns. I thought that was kind of interesting. And also the, uh, the gun is uh, maybe reminiscent of uh, what you might expect to find uh, from uh, the maybe prototypical Bedouin uh, of, you know, long ago. If you think about the times of like the... Uh, Flash Gordon serials, and you know, and before that, you know, the the desert people. If you've ever watched uh, you know, Lawrence of Arabia, you know, the the Bedouin were using uh, single shot rifles and different things like that to get by uh, until they got properly armed later. So, and I mean, at one time, a single shot and rifle was properly armed. So it just depends how far back you go. But I thought that this was uh, really just really great ideas for how that how that gun might be designed. I just know, I know that later, you know, we've seen some of that come forward in the Mandalorian in, uh, in its concepts, but you know, here it is early in development back in the seventies. This is kind of where those ideas grew out of, you know, a lot of the things that you see in star Wars now are the children of these concepts that Ralph McQuarrie helped Lucasfilm to lay down so expertly. And of course, you know, as I said before, here he has a concept and then they brought it to life almost one for one in the movie. What a feeling that must have been to see your art brought to life like that. If you remember this scene from the movie, uh, Ben Kenobi and Luke stand and look out over the vast wasteland and they see Moss Eisley and that's where you hear the original line of you will never see a more wretched hive of scum and villainy. But it is pretty cool that that idea went from there to here or from here to there. Now, I don't know what those marks are on there. They could very well be from later. Here's a great close-up. So the speeder clearly at one time had uh, was an enclosed bubble, which really doesn't seem like a bad idea. If you're going over about 25 miles an hour, it's nice to have protection from the elements, unless you're going to wear a helmet and protective gear like on a motorcycle. And uh, this has a definitely, even for the 70s, this has a really cool retro feel to it. You know, this looks like something almost from the 50s, especially with like the wing tanks hanging out on the end there and everything. We had some old aircraft like that around an Air Force base I was stationed at in Japan many years ago, and they used them to tow darts that F-16s would shoot down. And so there's, uh, you know, the character of Luke carrying a, a rifle that is you know, something that you might see uh, turn of the century, last century, you know, Bedouins carrying. And there's a close-up of the concept for Moss Eisley. And of course, we've got the twin sons of Tatooine. Lucas described to uh, Macquarie the prospect from the cliff when the Moss Eisley spaceport is first in view. Luke Skywalker, clearly seen as a girl in this painting, was a girl at this point in the development of the story. 
C-3PO and R2-D2 can be seen uh, behind the winged land speeder. This elaborate vehicle became somewhat more streamlined in the film. The full bubble was retained, but was always kept open to a half bubble for the convenience of filming. Certainly not the convenience of actual use, right? If you've ever driven around in a uh, convertible, that's fun, but not if you're going to an interview. So there is Luke Skywalker conceptualized as a girl. How cool would that have been? George would have really been seen as somebody who was ahead of his time. And of course, it's okay that he didn't do it, but it really would have been something to actually do it. If you think about some other stories from the time frame, uh, I don't think it was much longer after this that John Varley wrote the novel Titan, and the main character of that science fiction novel is Shirako Jones, a woman, and then we had Ellen Ripley come along not much longer in uh, Alien. So, you know, there was definitely something in the zeitgeist then that uh, the female protagonist was ascendant. So, and uh, as I had mentioned before, many of the germinal ideas of the seminal or germinal ideas of Star Wars are contained in this portfolio, and they just came out in later films but they were definitely ahead of their time. I remember not caring for this image too much uh, when I was a kid, because I was a kid and I had never hung out in any bars, uh, so I didn't know any better. I hadn't been through military service, and I didn't know what trouble looked like. So now when I look at this, you know, I, I find it somewhat humorous and also very entertaining. Uh, this is a, a very early conceptual idea for the cantina, and I mean, we have a uh, C-3PO who's still pretty much being envisioned the same way as kind of a, almost like a Tin Man character and R2-D2 uh, over here. And R2-D2 reminds me much more of the way robots were portrayed in manga at the time. And uh, of course, the, there's trouble brewing, but the stormtroopers uninterested. I guess, I guess, you know, when you think about the legal systems, perhaps maybe what they're doing is acceptable. I like the idea of the creature that Luke is facing off with there. And the most interesting thing that you're looking at here is that this is Luke Skywalker, not Han Solo getting into a, uh, a shootout with somebody. This was earlier in the concept for Star Wars and uh, early on Luke Skywalker was much more realized, um, had, had much more talent and much more skill, and uh, I guess had apparently developed himself in other ways. And I thought it was interesting that they switched him over to the more Campbellian uh, model of somebody who, you know, has to be tried and tested in order to become uh, the fully realized, you know, twice born man sort of concept of the cosmogonic cycle and the hero's journey and all that other stuff. So, I mean, it's, it's uh, certainly uh, for the benefit of the story, it was a great idea because it played really well because nobody likes a hero who shows up and 10 minutes later is beating the shit out of people like he or she has always had these abilities. There's no journey there. You're already there. So it's much more interesting to see a hero start off as a nobody and become a somebody. Uh, another thing that's in this is you see these floating globes here, and they're like uh, suspensor globes, which are, you know, it's ubiquitous to Star Wars now. But uh, that was uh, a subtle borrow and nod to Frank Herbert, because that technology existed in Dune, which was a great influence on... George Lucas before it existed in Star Wars. Let's take a closer look. This is also a great use of color. I, I always enjoy the complementary color scheme of blue and orange or related colors. So if we take a close look at this, and honestly, <laughs> I've never zoomed in this close on this before. I really love this. I love that little R2 unit. That is such a great idea for R2. But I never realized that that one creature is kind of a giant owl. I mean, I fucking love that. I'm not sure what that is, but it's cool too. These are interesting, well-realized alien creatures. I don't think conceiving uh, aliens was probably M Macquarie's thing. You know, he was probably more of a uh, machine and architecture sort of structural guy. So coming up with these characters like this is, you know, really well done. And I, I don't know, maybe I'm glad that Luke Skywalker didn't run around with goggles on his forehead and a, 
and a cap. But I don't know, maybe that would have been cool too. And the other guy's got his gun out of his holster, so he better get moving. Looks like a chair got knocked over. That's an essential part of any good bar fight, right? Some of you have probably been in bar fights. I was actually on hand for one one time where I got up and I moved away from the bar fight so quickly that my shoulder hit the jaw of the owner of the bar because I was actually sitting and talking to him and I knocked him out. So it was an accident. But I, I did knock somebody out in a bar room fight one time. As the heroes move along, they, they find a transport off of the planet, as you recall from the story, and that's when they get introduced to walking around the corner and seeing the Millennium Falcon for the first time. And if you're like me, if you remember the very first time that you've seen Star Wars, if you had no, no other touchstones for the movie, when Luke Skywalker calls the Millennium Falcon an old piece of junk, I mean, I remember as a kid, the first time, even many times afterwards, I looked at that and I thought, like, that does not look like a piece of junk to me. But my understanding of that was that George Lucas was a part of hot rod culture in California. And sometimes a hot rod would look like a piece of junk, but it would come in and beat everybody. And so that was kind of the concept. And I mean, it also just kind of adds a flourish that you don't normally see in science fiction movies, right? Up until Star Wars, I don't remember anybody in either Japan, where science fiction also had a firm hold at the time in, in anime and manga, or anywhere in America, uh, you know, pointing out that the hero spaceship was an old piece of junk. You know, they're, they're almost, they, you almost always highlighted their special abilities and their amazing abilities. But, you know, one of the amazing things about the Millennium Falcon is that it doesn't look like much. I mean, to them, you know, certainly not to us, but to them it doesn't look like much, but it can really do some things. So it says the main characters are assembled here just prior to liftoff at Moss Eisley. They are in costumes like those in the film. The Moss Eisley pit, which houses Han Solo's Millennium Falcon, is quite a bit more sophisticated here with huge mechanical lifts on tracks uh, than it had in the film. And, uh, you know, this, uh, this, this idea of spaceships being surrounded by scaffolding and lifts and tracks and different things like that is definitely something that you would have read about, not seen, but read about in uh, science fiction novels. Uh, there, there was definitely kind of a uh, workman-like approach to such things in many good stories, including uh, the works of Samuel Delaney, for instance. I would recommend reading his short stories. He has a very interesting uh, repair culture around spaceships and uh, things in the future in his stories, and it's well worth exploring. He has a great anthology called I and Gamora, which contains that story plus many others. I recommend it. The Star Pit especially is a very good short story. So here we have the intrepid crew. So there's that great R2 concept. It's almost like the R2 that we all know, but it seems like the top of him might be more of a glass dome over circuitry, which would have fit perfectly with what we knew of what we thought robots would be like and the way the computers and circuitry worked back then. So I always, once again, I really like that Macquarie made it the future, but he also made it a little bit about where they were at too. And there's C-3PO and Chewbacca. We have Ben and Luke. And uh, it's interesting that they're all a group and perhaps Chewbacca is just escorting them. We can only guess, right? But over here, they meet their pilot for the first time. We pull back, we get a great look at the much more hard-edged and clean-looking Millennium Falcon. And there's the cockpit blister. The armament's much more forward in this design. It's really, really a great image with... Uh, I mean, you know, I, I can't artistically criticize anything that Macquarie has done. I can only compliment it. I, I, uh, I love the, the foreground element of them coming in under an overhang, which opens into a larger pit, you know, like an open air pit, or like in the Air Force, we would have called them uh, revetment, you know, where the, where the ship is waiting. You put aircraft in revetments and pits to protect them from bombing, but also if they explode for any reason, their explosion doesn't destroy everything else. So that's why you put ships like that instead of side by side, uh, as the Russians figured out very quickly in Ukraine. 
And it's not like they didn't know it, but if one ship blows up, it'll take the others around it right along with it. So it's, a, it's just kind of interesting, you know, little technical details like that bring a certain uh, verisimilitude to a story and can make it much more interesting. These next couple images show the capture of the Millennium Falcon. And I think that, you know, especially this image is almost a one for one from the movie. If you recall, there's a really great piece of special effects work in the film where the Millennium Falcon is very slowly entering this opening inside of a building. And I think I remember drawing pictures of that or things like that, especially based on other artwork I had seen. For years as a kid, I just wanted to portray that. And I mean, you really can't beat that uh, Macquarie got it done here before anyone. His concept for the turbo cannons there, by the way, appears to be exactly what they used in the movie. They didn't even, they didn't even change a single detail on them, which again, I mean, imagine conceptualizing something and then seeing it alive in a movie like that, you know, so to speak. But there's just a more great line detail by Macquarie. I mean, it's the amount of work it takes to put that, you know, into a painting, let alone a drawing. It's really something. See, these little, these little things in the background become very significant. It's just a blot of paint, but it looks like an entrance, right? And it's just the, the trickery of the eye with painting and with film is sometimes these subtle things, they become really important things for convincing you that you're in scenario. There's a, basically a metal cliff's edge, heavily armed radar dishes, stuff that even now is becoming, you know, antique. There's a great close-up of one of the turbo cannons. This is coming in. And I mean, I've seen uh, Sid Mead portray similar things. Uh, small people in the foreground elements really can give a sense of mass to things that are moving off in the background. And there's even detail going in there. And that lighting structure, you know, is all over Star Wars. Those oblong kind of lozenge shaped lights. There's just so much to see in an image like this. You know, you can just drink it in. It's so enjoyable. So without changing up, we'll just keep filming this. This is the next one. This is when the Millennium Falcon is actually being held. And we'll bring this into this. I really love this plate is just detail laden. And there's really a sense of depth. And, uh, you know, there's almost a three dimensional quality to the shadowing work done on the uh, on the, all the various rafter and cage work there. And of course, a small character standing in the background is gonna give us a great sense of depth and mass. So even these small characters have gesture. You know, if you've ever studied art, you know how important gesture is. And the basic concept on the Stormtrooper does really appear to be coming together here. What I really like about this image is there's a lot going on in the background here. You know, there's, there's people doing things. And it really comes together just for a beautiful image that reminds us all exactly of what we saw in the movie. And in that sequence, here's the final one. And this is just the same thing shot from another angle because there were probably you know, concerns about the Millennium Falcon being held on the Death Star before it escapes. And also this was a great way to show how they wanted to build the Millennium Falcon. You know, the actual Millennium Falcon here is very smooth. I mean, well, that makes sense when you're conceptualizing it, right? There wouldn't be a lot going on. Aircraft are smooth because they're aircraft, but this is a spacecraft too. It can fly in both environments. And so the later, the later versions of it were definitely covered in more what you might want to call grable work. And again, th these figures have a certain amount of gesture to them, which, you know, makes them much more believable. There's just some really excellent work done there in conceptualizing the front of a Karelian freighter because, uh, you know, this part is designed to mate up to another part so that you can load and offload cargo. I didn't learn that until many years later. But I, I, do, like, I do like the use of lighting around here, and I wonder if the, 
the radiance of the light on the painting was uh, done with an airbrush. There's a close-up on the cockpit area. We all remember this scene from Star Wars, right? This is when they're using Chewbacca as a fake prisoner to gain access to where the princess is being held so they can rescue her. If we just pull in here, see a great use of these uh, contrasting and complementary colors here. They're so well done. Painting little small characters like that and giving them gesture can really add a lot to your work, but think about how hard that is to do and make it look good. It's really just got that great architectural style. And we know that that droid showed up later, right? Remember that? Oh, that's amazing. And there they are. I think that, you know, here we see Chewbacca being much more realized as a character, much more finalized, close anyway, although not at all blue. That would have been cool. The Stormtrooper concept definitely seems to be coming together. These uh, lift tubes, I mean, that's this, this scene, you know, in particular, probably almost one for one in the film, right? Very little change. And what do we have this guy doing down here? What's he doing? What the hell's, what? Look at that. That is just wonderful. He's down there doing his thing. That poor son of a bitch isn't going to last though, right? Because this is the Death Star. Should have got off while you had a chance. Now, as you'll recall in the movie, this scene doesn't happen. And back in 1977, when I was just a 12-year-old kid and I had seen the movie 20 times, seeing this scene with this gargoyle-looking Darth Vader, it just kind of blew my mind. You know what I mean? It just had a much more Japanese samurai look to his outfit and his, his attitude. It was uh, really fascinating. And uh, I know I remember now that uh, you know Luke is wearing the breathing apparatus that he's wearing, which resembles a, like a Draeger system that a Navy SEAL might wear. He's wearing that because the hull of the ship was breached. And, you know, in Star Wars, Luke is not competent enough to fight Darth Vader with a lightsaber. That doesn't come along until the next movie and, uh, and the next. You know, he has his place as a hero, but, you know, they, they never denied that he had something to learn. So it's uh, fascinating to see how they, they were cognizant of how they wanted to develop this and how they wanted Luke to grow that this scene doesn't take place in the first movie. Now, what you might notice when you look at this image is that there's a signature on there, and that does say Vader. That is the signature of David Prowse's stand-in. David Prowse, you know, as you know, played Darth Vader in, in the movie. He's the man in the suit, not the voice, of course. This guy was David Prowse's understudy, stand-in, assistant, the whole nine yards. He was just, a, just as big and imposing a man as Prowse, and so he could wear the... Darth Vader suit, and if there was, a, you know, if David Prowse needed a break, this guy would come in and stand in for him, probably for blocking shots and different things like that too, getting things set up. Uh, you know, it's a, a shoot can be a long day's work, so it's always nice to have a backup, I would imagine. Anyway, I just remember that this guy came to see us all at a place called Park City in Lancaster, and Park City was built on a field that my dad grew up playing in as a boy, a gigantic, just acres and acres of farmland. Uh, where my dad used to hunt and camp as a boy. They took it all and literally paved over paradise and put up a parking lot. And so my dad's happy hunting grounds as a boy got turned into the mall where I went to meet Darth Vader. And if you remember, you know, in the 80s, the rise of the mall in, in America was definitely a, a big thing, a, a huge cultural movement. Now, beyond all that land, they had uh, some more hunting ground for those of us who liked to hunt when I was a kid. And that is now a development uh, where a good friend of mine lives. So things change. But anyway, as we look at this image, this signed image, it says here that Luke is fighting Darth Vader in what was to have been a scuffle aboard the Rebel blockade runner soon after Vader's Imperials captured the Rebel ship. Luke is wearing a kind of breath mask because Vader's troopers apparently cut through a panel to get in, allowing the air to escape. The Vader costume, a grotesque breath mask, and all sorts of other life support systems, computer readout, black cape, and armor, was partly inspired by the impressive image of the samurai warrior. George Lucas, in keeping with the idea that Vader's whole being was to be mysterious, wanted the character to be entirely in black. 
And well, that is just a really cool image, isn't it? Such a great use of lighting there. It's well done. I would love to see, or would have loved to have seen, this image done by uh, Frank Frazetta. And then I'd like to have seen it done again, redone by someone like Boris Vallejo. And then I would have loved to have seen it redone again by Sid Mead. And boy, wouldn't that be a great series of panels to have hanging up in your house if you're a science fiction fan. This is, I think, maybe the best of the images that are in the entire portfolio. And it's the one that I certainly gravitated towards the most as a boy. And that makes sense because it does show the most kind of swashbuckle adventure. Here we are at the Rebel base on Yavin. This is a great concept of the idea that the Rebel base on Yavin was supposed to be among the ruins of an old civilization that was long gone, but had left behind these giant stone ruins which in and of themselves were great protection, but of course, nothing is a protection from the Death Star, right? So here we have more great detail work. See, the stonework is pitted and old and overgrown with moss. I wonder if uh, Ralph McQuarrie went to Art Center in California. I think he you know, certainly went somewhere where he learned to be an excellent artist. Here we have the small details of what's going on. And in the background, you can see they're getting the fighters ready. On the fourth moon of Yavin, rebel troops at Maasai ready themselves for battle. Macquarie felt this Aztec-like ruin might be, the, uh, might be made of large, unthinkably dense stones with the property of minimizing gravity. The lights of small fighter spacecraft are visible deep within the structure. And uh, this, this lends itself back to something I commented on before, and that is to be a great conceptual artist. To do the kind of art where you're conceptualizing what's going to happen in a movie, you, you have to have an amazing sense of scenario. Sid Mead used to talk about this all the time, that uh, one of the keys to being a great designer and a great conceptualist, a, a, you know, visual futurist like him, was that you had to have a solid sense of scenario Later, you just learn to extrapolate that skill much, much more and much more precisely as an artist working for uh, bitchy film directors. This is a uh, view of them getting ready to go and fight the Battle of Yavin against the Death Star. I know, I think down in the comments there, or in the, uh, in the writing at the bottom here, it talks about how, <laughs> it's not the comments, boy. Uh, Times have changed, right? Uh, it talks about how Macquarie was influenced by looking at images of carrier operations aboard uh, aircraft carriers. Here's just, it's just a great view of a Y-wing getting ready to go. And uh, once again, the use, the use of color and light there is very convincing and very well done. Macquarie's aircraft appear to be just a little sleeker, a little harder edged, a little sharper than what they wound up using in the movie, a little less bulk, which I think, uh, you know, lends credence to their, their ability to actually have been real flying machines. But that's just nitpicking. And there's enough of that in geekdom. I'm not entirely sure why this entire image I used the word entirely a lot there, didn't I? It has kind of a yellowing to it, and that's not actually a lighting or camera effect that I, that I can see if I'm even blocking various light sources. Uh, this, this one has uh, yellowed and faded a little bit, and uh, of course there is some visible staining on it. And I mean, I'm talking about this like I'm selling it, but I'm not going to. This image 
is, uh, I thought, was uh, very, very well done in the movie. If you watch the movie and if you can get hold of Star Wars before George Lucas did the, uh, what, what should we call it, enhancements. Um, I know that people have other names for it, but we'll just be nice. And we'll stick to calling that the enhanced version. People probably aren't as upset about the enhancements now as they were back when they were actually done. But this scene in the movie was portrayed again, almost one for one. I believe this guy was more like over this way. And then the fighters were seen going away that way. But they were just little white dots like they are here in this image in the movie. And there was the sound of their engines, um, you know, spinning up so that they could go faster and break orbit, break into orbit. So it was just really well done. In the, in the enhanced version, there's a whole bunch of stupid ass ships lifting up and they're just kind of mulling around in the air and you don't get any sense of takeoff and ascent, you know, flying off to do combat. And I thought that was really a loss. So if you can find that original scene in Star Wars, I recommend it. I would post a clip of it here, but who knows whether that would demonetize me or get me in some kind of trouble for, well, I'm not monetized anyway, so it doesn't matter but it might get me uh, some kind of a copyright strike or some other shit like that. Uh, you know, YouTube and the uh, powers that be from the Motion Picture Association are pretty cutthroat. You know, they, they, don't, they want us to have fun, but not too much fun. So anyway, uh, this image portrays the uh, jungle-like realm of the planet Yavin. You've got that lonely guy hanging out there as lookout. Truth be told, with that much technology, would you really need a guy doing that? Well, it doesn't matter. It's the human touch, which was important to Lucas, and it looks cool. Would you want a job like that, though? If you've ever been in the military, have you stood guard? You know what it's like pulling guard duty. It's not fun. But someone's got to do it, so I'm glad that guy's doing it. The next three images are from the battle with the Death Star near the planet Yavin. This is uh, Y-wings cutting across the axis. This is just a really great representation of, I think, what Ralph McQuarrie did best. These mechanical details and architectural structure along with great lighting and use of color. His color palette throughout all of these is essentially unified. And I mean, in all of the images, he never goes too far one way or the other. And it really, really just gives this entire portfolio kind of a unified feel to it. Now, I would not want to say that that is the gun of the Death Star, but I mean, it is kind of interesting that it's there, right? Uh, I'm sure that concept changed over time, but I can't speak to that one way or the other. However, it is cool looking. I'm going to try to hold that steady for you there. We zoom in. Even the distant ships are well drawn. Just little features, you know, exhaust ports, entries, different things like that. It's very well done. Then the battle continues on. And, uh, you know, in this one, I, I thought it was uh, another great representation of uh, what I really liked about Macquarie's approach is the, the aircraft are just a little less laden and a little more sharp imaged. And this was kind of the height of military aircraft design at the time that he was doing it. If you think back to the, uh, the F-15, and the, uh, the impending F-16, and some of the concepts and things that he would have seen for future ideas that were coming. You know, the X-Wing is definitely seems to have a less bulk and is just a little more streamlined. And the backgrounds for the Death Star are very well done. And you know, I can't say where the influence water flows. You know, did uh, anime portray this sort of thing first? Anime and manga? Or was it the other way around? Because I know that Japanese artists were heavily influenced by Star Wars because we all were. And then there's this final image. 
This is the final. There's one more image to go, and this is the final one of the Death Star run. They're awful close to the end there, so I can't help thinking that the exhaust port they're looking for that was designed into the Death Star, we learn later, so that it could be defeated. Which means it wasn't just a dumb, stupid design flaw. Okay, well, it's a nice idea anyway, right? It was a problem that never needed an answer, but it's just the way fandom goes, I guess. It's the way stories go these days. There's just remarkable detail there. It's interesting because it's it's you know there's a, it's a flat, smooth piece of work, and there's really not a whole lot of detail going on there when you look at it at second thought. But it, there's just enough detail to make it look thoroughly involved. Very well done. We'll just go ahead and get that out of the way. And then here's the final image. And of course the final image is the throne room, which is the end of the movie. And although this is not exactly one for one, it's pretty close. And uh, it's certainly uh, indicative of how that final scene was going to go. And I mean, here we see a uh, long blonde haired Princess Leia. That changed. And uh, here's our heroes, including Ben Kenobi, it would look like. Well, we know he was there in spirit, right? So anyway, here we see our heroes, including Ben Kenobi and the robots, the droids. So. They did, they did some changes, of course, to that, but I mean, I'm sure that most of that was probably the needs of the film more than the needs of anything else. You know, budget costs, camera angles, and also just pulling it off in one way or the other, things change. You can see the uh, guards there certainly have a stormtrooper-esque look to them. And uh, also carrying a spear. And some of these things we see turning up later in uh, Imperial soldiers later, because once again, these images heavily influenced, I think, the way that Star Wars went later. Get a good look at the crowd here. If you've ever stood around in armor, you know that it's not a lot of fun. So it would be nice to get the ceremony over with so everyone could just get back to wearing comfortable clothing. Thanks for hanging out with me and geeking out with me while we look through this great old portfolio. I haven't looked through this thing in a very long time. So it was a lot of fun to go down memory lane with you with these images. Uh, if you've enjoyed looking at these uh, portfolio plates with me, or if you have anything that you'd like to add, uh, please feel free to do so in the comments. I, I welcome your input, your comments, your enthusiasm, your shared uh, Star Wars love, and all those other good things. And uh, if you're thinking about it, please uh, like and subscribe. You know that that always helps with video content here on YouTube. And again, I'd like to thank you for stopping by and enjoying this video, and I hope you did enjoy it. And uh, that'll do it. Have a good day.